before we get started on what your journey is in FinOps, uh, when we think about Equifax, we think about this as the leading consumer credit company. Um, tell us a little bit more about the business. Tell us a little bit yep. more about the vision or the mission of the company and all the areas of businesses that you guys really do. So we get a little bit of a context. Sure, yeah. So, I mean, most people know us as a credit trading agency, but incidentally, our biggest business is not credit trading anymore, which is very fascinating. When I tell this to folks, people can't relate to that. Uh, we have a, uh, an employment um, verification business. Uh, you know, we are leaders in that space. So our business model, very simply put, is you know, we get data from several contributors and suppliers. Uh, that, you know, the data is continuously coming into our ecosystem, batch, streaming, you know, whatever way. In many cases, it, it's not even reports in our ecosystem. We you know, get it at real time as we are you know, delivering a product. And our goal is to participate in as many decisions as possible. Um, you know, decisions that our customers make. Um, if, you, if you talk about a bank, you know, they're making decisions on behalf of the customer, verifying the customer, uh, the identity of the customer, uh, making a decision whether to lend uh, you know, to that customer, offer a certain type of product uh, to that customer. And we'd like to participate in as many possible decisions that the bank make and inform those decisions with our data and our analytics. So really that's yeah. really our goal. And of course, you know, we have a voracious appetite for data, so we will get, take data from anywhere in any format. Um, and the biggest challenge we have is that all of the data we monetize, we don't originate in our ecosystem. So a lot of the traditional companies have, you know, they build, you know, the data comes from within the company itself, so you have some control, um, maybe not as much, but at least you can influence the quality of the data. Unfortunately, we can't do that. You know, we get data from suppliers, but we are mandated to produce the best quality of data when we deliver our products because there are regulatory implications, there are obviously reputational challenges if we deliver bad data. And we, the most important part, we may impact a consumer negatively, right? A decision may be made, you know, uh, in, in, not in favor of the consumer, which, which we absolutely don't want. So, so that is our biggest challenge, uh, is yeah. how do we bring data in, but then deliver real pristine, high quality data yeah. in highly regulated use cases. So that's, that's uh, you know, kind of great. summarizes what we do as a business. Yeah. Which is a great segue into what we're gonna talk about. So before we get into FinOps, yep. help us understand a little bit about the data fabric yep. that Equifax has, and, and it, which yeah. all these different data sources coming yeah. in, ever increasing data sources, ever increasing data consumers. Yeah. How do you go from ideation to a product very, very quickly yep. with yep. an organization that ultimately is a data company? Yeah. So very simply put, I mean, what, you know, why did we build the data fabric? And the whole, the problem that we wanted to solve, of course, we wanted to get onto a more secure, more modern tech stack. But very interestingly, when I joined Equifax, what I noticed was, even though we are a data analytics company, you know, at heart, we still had a lot of silos. Uh, all of our data domains that we collect um, were still siloed stovepipes. And it was very difficult to actually bring data together and deliver real-time decisions when you have siloed stove, stovepipe data on different technologies, you know, built on different, uh, you know, metadata ecosystems. So you're trying to stitch all this together real-time. You can't hit SLAs. You can't, you know, uh, meet the real-time decisioning that is required for our customers to be able to make decisions. So, so one of the goals of this transformation of building the data fabric was to bring data together uh, and not just mash everything together because there are regulatory and contractual obligations of how we can bring data together. Mm -hmm. So have a governed, auditable ecosystem that can bring data together in a, with all the observability as to you know, what data comes together and deliver products uh, in, a, in, a, uh, yeah. in, in a much easier, much, co much more co cost efficient manner. Yeah. Right? And of course, secure, secure, a much more secure way. So that was the reason we built um, you know, the data fabric. And it was, it was, it's a platform that's, um, you know, what we, we would like to call as, it, it kind of puts Equifax in a box. So if you were yeah. to start Equifax in another uh, country, you could take this whole ecosystem, deploy it, and you could run this value chain that Equifax d does, bringing in data and delivering products. We'd love you to know, double click and understand that. Yeah, yeah. But what you guys are doing is yeah. something that a lot of companies want to emulate, so. Yeah, so this is kind of like a very functional view of our um, data fabric ecosystem. Very simply put, you know, on the left-hand side, we bring in data from several different 
um, you know, several categories of data from suppliers. And our data fabric ecosystem is a combination of operational data pipelines that is delivering our products mm -hmm. and analytics solutions real time. And, and our, uh, what you would call our innovation ecosystem. This is where our data science community comes in and builds, you know, models, scores, mm -hmm. um, you know, attributes or features that we sell to our customers on our data, mm -hmm. right? And that, and that those models and scores are really then deployed into our operational pipeline. And the, the simple stages of the data fabric is really ingestion. We're bringing in data, different types of workloads, ingesting data into the ecosystem. We do something called keying and linking, which is uh, very simply put, uh, the mother of all um, master data management systems because we are doing this at population scale. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we are looking at the entire population and identifying Kumar men and, you know, within that population across all the domains of data that, you know, that, uh, that we collect. And then we purpose the data for very specific products. Uh, and this is where we apply all the regulatory, um, you know, uh, rules uh, that mandate that only a certain set of data can be used only for specific purposes. So that's our uh, data fabric simple pipeline. Um, and then this system interacts with our analytical sandbox ecosystem, which sits on top. And basically what it allows our data scientists to do is write ingestion rules, tune ingestion rules, tune keying and linking rules. Uh, you know, we constantly look at new ways of identifying two identities and bringing them together if they're the same person. Mm -hmm. You know, so continuously tuning those, you know, rules, making our products more, more effective. Yeah. And then of course, building, you know, the scores yeah, and, the, and the features that we sell, you know, to our customers. And all of this so is obviously on the cloud? This is all now on the cloud. Yeah. Um, and that is a decision we made, you know, when we started rebuilding all of our technology stack and uh, it is all on GCP. Right. Uh, we chose GCP as our primary um, cloud vendor for all of our monetizable data. So that's mm -hmm. all on GCP. And that's, you know, that is what uh, facilitates our operational as well as our yeah. analytics uh, sandbox ecosystem. Yeah. That's great. So switching gears and talking about FinOps. So yeah. you went from on-premises yeah. to the cloud. Yeah your number of ingestion points and the number of consumers grew, the number yep. of people operating on this platform has grown. Yeah. What have been some key challenges in transitioning from that FinOps perspective from on-prem to the cloud? I think uh, the most important challenge I would say, you know, that's directly visible for me was obviously the culture of the engineering organization, mm -hmm. right? Uh, working in a on-prem ecosystem with, you know, hardware and you know any other kind of technology that you use yeah. already amortized there is no it wasn't a cost conscious organization so really didn't the folks didn't really understand what does it mean to build things what is the cost optimization that you have to engineer into your platforms when you're building things so that was the biggest challenge is really bringing in that discipline and yeah. and, and really training scale, like how many engineers how many data engineers and scientists are we talking uh, so it's in my team itself is about uh, 600 people globally, yeah. and we're talking about roughly more than 60% of them are data engineers, yeah. uh, DevOps people, yeah. and uh, ML, um, you know, AI engineers. And then the business right. analysts, that's a separate and, community. And that's a separate community. The data yeah. science, you know, yeah. community is, uh, you know, it's a separate community. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, the second challenge was obviously educating the, the, the data science community on what, what this means, right? Um, they were so used to, uh, you know, innovation, they were, not, they were not used to putting price on innovation, right? So what does it cost to actually build a model or build a, yeah. you know, build a set of attributes that we want to sell? You could on-prem on just you know, run things, you yeah. know, keep continuing to iterate, uh, you know, and, and, and there would be no cost implication. But on the cloud, that translates to uh, you know, significant amount of cost. And we've right. had, in the first couple of years, several interesting you know, use cases where people are running queries that cost seventy, hundred thousand dollars and they don't realize that until they start getting until they get the ticket. So so that that was the biggest the, the discipline was the biggest challenge. Yeah. The second challenge was obviously um, when you look at it beyond the engineering organization, you know, the financial uh, you know um, organization in terms of a very traditional CapEx OpEx model, you know, how do you think about this, you know, from a from a cloud perspective, right? Your mm -hmm. It's not predictable, mm -hmm. uh, so how do you make it predictable? Yeah. Um, and and so how how does finance get involved, tie closely with engineering to be able to kind of influence mm -hmm. 
yeah. you know, that discipline, right? I think that's very interesting because yeah. FinOps is a team sport. Yeah. So tell us which teams are involved, what roles they yeah. play, how they, how they, how they yeah. collaborate together. Yeah. So yeah, so what we found is you really have to bring product, engineering, finance, governance, mm. and operations functions together to be able to have effective FinOps. And we haven't perfected this by any way. You know, yeah. We learned through iterations. But at least it's better uh, than just the finance team sticking the, the bill in your face the, and saying, hey, bring this down. Ex exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, it's already a team sport in that way. Correct, which right. Is good. And the, you know, we found increasingly, you know, initially when, when, that, when we started, it was finance sticking the bill in the face and saying, what are you doing? Yeah. Started educating the engineering teams to, you know, start optimizing and being disciplined. Um, but then we realized that just doing it one off when a bill shows up is not good enough. Mm -hmm. How do you institute that as a practice? Uh, so mm -hmm. we had to put in a governance framework. Mm -hmm. uh, and the governance framework starts from all the way from, of course, your architecture. Um, and then on the cloud, how you tag and label your resources. Mm -hmm. What is your policy? So that you can you get the observability as to what, you know, what, what services yeah. you're running. And then, of course, the product team actually focusing on understanding what workloads are these services going to run. You know, what are the SLIs, what are the SLOs, what are the SLAs we are trying to hit, right? Capturing that as a part of the product roadmap, mm -hmm. right? Often, Give us an example of that. A simple example is, you know, for example, we have to deliver a credit file and the budget that we get in terms of performance, uh, you know, numbers within a transaction is roughly about 200 milliseconds mm -hmm. to be able to deliver a credit file. Now, Having that as a part of your product roadmap that you yeah. have to engineer and optimize to be able to do that is very important so that as you're designing and architecting your product, you, your, your services, you already have to have that big tip, Got it. right? And understanding the cost of delivering yeah. that, yeah. right? So not all, all services have to be at 200 milliseconds. Yeah. So can you optimize your workloads to run these variable you know, or your services to run these variable workloads, yeah. right? So how can you make sure that you have that configurability in your system so that your business units can choose what workload you're running mm -hmm. and what type of SLA are you trying to hit. Mm -hmm. Because if you just give you know, a silver bullet type solution, that, okay, use this, then if everything will cost. Seconds, but at what cost? E exactly, at yeah. what cost, right? So really building that configurability in into your ecosystem is important. Yeah. And that's something that we realized as we were building that, you know, you got to give the ability for the business unit to think in terms of what they're delivering, what is the cost of the service yeah. so that they can understand you know, what the price uh, you know, should be. You know? Which is an interesting point because you've taken it definitely more advanced than a lot of users than we see in the market. You've taken it from understanding your infrastructure and services cost, yep. fit ops, to really marrying that with biz ops. Yep. So walk us through that. Like what does this unit cost mean yep. for Equifax? Help me break it down for all the audience over here. And how are you hoping to achieve that and what will be the consequences of you getting that sure. in you know, just business terms itself? Yeah. So one of the things that uh, while we were looking at how do we provide visibility to cost, the biggest challenge we always have is how do we make sure that you know, our, our services are optimized to be able to deliver the, you know, the products that are needed? So we came up with the notion of unit cost, and the unit cost is, again, you know, it's, it has to be defined at a service level in terms of what product you're offering. It may be a little easy for us because data is a product that we sell. Sure. Um, it becomes probably slightly difficult if you are not selling data and you're using data to sell a different type of product. How do you yeah. make sure that you build that correlation? So for us, you know, very simply put, an example would be uh, delivering a credit score on an inquiry or a credit file on an inquiry. You know, so the unit is delivering that credit file. Mm -hmm. So the very simple way that we compute that is we say, okay. How many credit files are you doing a day on average? Uh, roughly about eight to 10 million. Right. Uh, inquiries so breaking that, we get. that down on yeah. this cluster level to this one That's right. unit. That's okay. right. So when you deliver a credit file. That's not as simple as it sounds, is it? Uh, it's not, it's not. Yeah. Because there are a set of services that, uh, you know, play. Shared, in, yeah, yeah, so. Yeah. When an inquiry comes in from a bank, you know, we get the PII of the consumer. Yeah. You know, it then goes into our ecosystem and we got to search for that consumer. Yeah. Right. And then we got to pull in the, the credit related information for that consumer. And then we got to aggregate it and, you know, format it and send it out. If you're just sending a file. Right. If you're sending a score, we are, we are getting all that data. Yeah. We are 
computing the features and then computing the score and then sending the score out. Yeah. Right. So there are different services that come in play here. So what we do here is Thanks. what is the cost of running those services at that optimal 200 millisecond mm -hmm. you know, uh, mm -hmm. that we get to actually deliver that. And really, you know, building that observability to collect that data and then say, okay, this is what it costs us to do that. Yeah, yeah. So that's how we kind of define And then define you're thinking about the pricing, you're thinking about margins based on that's the That's right. So, so this is now just starting to happen where yeah. this observability is now starting to, you know, uh, get into the, the, into the product organization. They're starting to look at, yeah. is this product really making money? I mean, if I'm going to be, you know, this is the cost of actually building the product yeah. or delivering the product. Yeah. Is this actually making money? Is our price point... Optimal, should yeah. we look at a different price point? Um, are there products that we should sunset and we yeah. shouldn't be you know, se selling anymore because it's not going to make any money? So those discussions have started because of the observability into the cost yeah. that we are able to show. Um, That's amazing. But it's, it's a journey that uh, you know, we've been on for the last uh, two and a half, you know, three years since we've started you know, putting significant workloads on the cloud. Yeah. And uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a learning you know, process, I would say. Um, That's and, great. and it's a transformation for is. the entire organization. Yeah. Listen, I don't want to take away from the audience asking you questions, Absolutely, but yeah. one last question for me. You've gone through this journey, yeah. over two and a half, three years. Top two lessons learned. I think the first one is get the discipline and the education into the engineering organization as, as quickly as possible. Uh, that's the first thing. I think we were late uh, realizing that even though Google themselves told us there's yeah. going to be yeah. a lot of training needed for the engineering. But there was more focus on technology than the. That's right. We were, you know, everybody was build, focused on building features, yeah. leveraging new capabilities, and doing that. So that that took us some time to get, you know, get used to that. I think getting the different organizations together and having this discussion up front, you know, it's a financial transformation, it's a business transformation, yeah. it's a product transformation. Mm -hmm. uh, so doing it. Uh, you know, bottom up with technology pushing is always a challenge. Uh, so it has to be top down. Um, I think we kind of were overly, you know, bottom up when we started this. Yeah. Uh, because the the real move to the cloud was security, tech stack, modernization, etc. Uh, but I think this we soon realized that this is just yes, not just a technology transformation. This is really transforming how the company works. Absolutely. You know? So that yeah. getting that realization early on is is. Yeah really critical yeah thank you so thank much you. for, for yeah. being here thank you. congratulations thank you. To thank you thanks